How many of you have ever read a book and got to the end of it and went, Really? Really? I just spent how much time reading this story and that's all I get? It's a great story, but the ending's not really so much. Right? It's kind of what we get this morning from the Gospel of Mark, right? We have this great story. And Mark ends the story with the women leaving the tomb in fear and amazement and saying nothing to anyone. Now, if you were following along in your bulletin, you might be saying, well, well, Pastor, you didn't actually read all of what was... You're right, I didn't read all of what was written there. Um, Because, if you notice, part of that said that there's a shorter ending to the Gospel of Mark, there's a longer ending to the Gospel of Mark, and then, beyond what we have in our bulletin today, there's the longer, longer ending of the Gospel of Mark. Because, I believe, as most scholars believe, that Mark ended where I stopped this morning. Because if you look at the context and the textual use and the word usage and what follows that verse in the rest of the Gospel of Mark, it's different than the rest of it. And you have to wonder, monks sitting there copying these texts over and over again, and they got to the end of this story, this great and wonderful story about a man who lived his life in love of others and did what God called him to do and did all of these wonderful things, and he died and he rose from the grave, and it ends with women running away from the spot where he was laid, saying nothing to anyone. It's a really bad ending to a really great story. So you have to think, maybe the monks thought it needs a better ending. So they added a little bit, and then they didn't really like that, so they added a little bit more. But I really don't think Mark had writer's block. It's a really great story that may not have ended yet. Because you see, there's a lot of stuff in this story that's good. These women are on their way to the tomb, right? Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James. And who is James' brother? Jesus. Jesus, thank you. Jesus, right? So Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and Salome. You can ask me later who Salome is. I'll tell you, I don't have the first clue. She's the disciple that followed Jesus. And she happened to be with Mary Magdalene and Mary that morning, and they were going on their way to the tomb. And they went to the tomb, and they saw that the big stone had already been rolled away, and when they walked in, they saw an angel. And the angel said to them, Don't be terrified. Would that help you at all, really? You just buried the man you'd been following for three years, who happens to be the son of one of the three of you, And now he's not here, and there's somebody in white telling you not to be afraid. I'd probably turn around and run, personally, screaming. It would be terrifying. But they stand there and they listen, and this person tells them that, don't be afraid, he's not here. He told you he wasn't going to be here. Right? It's like the office assistants. You walk into the office, you want to go see the boss, you walk into to to see your boss, and you walk up, and the office assistant says, I'm sorry, you just missed him. Right? He, just, he, he left for a moment, but he, he'll be back. Don't worry. He's not here. But as he told you, go and tell the disciples and Peter. The disciples and Peter. Isn't Peter one of the disciples? But remember what happened just a couple of days ago. Jesus told him that he was going to do it, and Peter did what? He denied Christ three times. Not just once. Not twice. But three times, Peter denied Christ. And what is this right here where this angel says to these women, he says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. It's not meaning that Peter is not one of the disciples. I tell you this right here, this is true grace. This is the understanding that Peter is still one of them. And not only is he a disciple, but he gets named. Right? He has a name. Jesus made sure that this messenger told the women to go and tell the disciples and Peter. Peter, Peter, you messed up. But you know what? I still love you. And you're still a part of this group. You're still a part of this band of misfits. You're still a part of this group that doesn't seem to ever get it right. But I still love every last one of you. So there they are. These three women. And they get this story from these angels. And they hear it and they're amazed and they're terrified. And what do they do? Nothing, really. They leave in fear and amazement and tell no one 
anything. Because Mark had writer's block and didn't know how to end this great story. No, that's not what they that's not what Mark said. That's what the women did. But it's also what Peter and John did. If you read the Gospel of John, chapter 20, it talks about how Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the rock rolled away and went and told Peter and John that somebody had taken Jesus. And Peter and John run to the tomb and they walk in and they see an empty tomb. And it actually says that the disciples that Jesus loved, John, saw and believed. But what did he believe? We don't know because right next, the next verse says that they still didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So John saw and believed, but what exactly did he believe? Because the two of them then left the tomb and went home. They're so moved by the resurrection of their Savior and their teacher and their leader that they went home and did nothing. Kind of like the women who left the tomb and did nothing. But see, here's the kicker. Because we're here this morning and we think that the resurrection is the end of the story. The resurrection is not the end of the story. The resurrection is not end. The resurrection is an invitation. The resurrection is an invitation to each and every one of us. You see, because I didn't say everything that the angel said to the women in the tomb, right? He said, do not be terrified for he is not here. He has risen Go and tell the disciples and Peter that he has gone ahead of you to Galilee and will meet you there, just as he had told you. You see, Mark was not written to a crowd to try to convince them that the resurrection had happened. Mark was written to us, people who already believed that Jesus rose from the dead, people that already believed that he was going to do everything that he told us he was going to do, people that already believed that he died on that cross for us and that he told us Time and time again that he was going to rise from the dead. So we shouldn't be surprised that he walked out of the tomb. Mark was written for us. It wasn't written to convince somebody that Jesus had risen. It was written for us. Mark didn't have writer's block. He remembered what he wrote at the very beginning. Bless you. The beginning of the Gospel of John is, the first verse, anyone other than Karis or Greta? Does anyone know the first verse of the Gospel of Mark is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Some scholars say that that's not actually the first verse, that that's actually the subtitle of Mark's Gospel. It's the Gospel going to Mark, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. However, most of the scholars that believe that Mark ends at chapter 16, verse 8a, where I read through today, also believe that that's not the subtitle. It is actually the first verse. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, is that the way to really start a book? Mark is the greatest book ever written that doesn't have a beginning or an end. It doesn't have the right lead-in. It doesn't have the right passages. It doesn't start the way that you're supposed to start it. English teachers, it's not a good model for students to look at to learn how to write. It doesn't do any setup. Mark says the beginning of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and kicks right into it with Jesus' baptism. And then he ends his gospel with three women running away in terror, not telling anybody about what had just happened. Why? Because Mark knows that this isn't the end of the story. Mark knows that Jesus' resurrection is an invitation to you to continue this story. Mark knows that Jesus' resurrection is an invitation to you to go and share God's love, that this is not the end, it's merely the beginning. This Sunday, when Jesus rose from the dead, it's not the end of our story. It's the beginning of how we continue to carry that love out into this world. It's how we continue to be Christ's light and Christ's feet and hands in a place that so desperately needs to see Him. You know that He said He was going to do this, that He said He was going to rise from the dead. And there's no reason for us to doubt it because He's done everything that He said He was going to do up to this point. Because He loves us. He loved us so much that He went to the cross to die for you. And then he walked out of the tomb to help you, to give you strength and power and love, to go out into the world to share that kindness, that mercy, that grace with everyone else who needs to see it, to be that light in the dark place. Because Christ loves us. Mark's gospel does not end. Because you, my friends, need to carry it on and continue the story. There is no end to this story. 
Because God's love is going to overpower and take over all the corners of darkness and evil in this world. And you are a part of that story. That's why the women left in fear and trembling. That's why we don't know what to say to people when they ask us about our faith. But you know what? We have no need to worry because Christ told us that he would always be with us and that he would give us the words to say and give us the strength and power to be the people that he's called us to be, to deliver his message to the world. So I invite you, Mark invites you, Jesus invites you to know that this resurrection is not the end of the story, but it's merely an invitation to you to walk out of those doors and to boldly share your faith in everything that you do, to show forth God's love to everyone in the world that you come in contact with. Because that's why God sent you. God loves you as you are, named you and claimed you as his own. You're a beloved child of his, and he calls you and names you, and claims you and sends you out into the world to share that love with each other. So go empowered by this invitation to share his love with everyone you meet. Hallelujah. Christ is risen.